Welcome to the podcast where relationships, confidence, and determination all converge into an amazing heartfelt experience. This is Speaking from the Heart. Welcome back to episode number 36 of Speaking from the Heart, in which we've been featuring businesses this past few weeks and which have made a substantial impact not only in the lives of others, but they also share from the heart. And I want to continue to thank all the businesses that helped to support the start of this podcast that have allowed me to be able to have the variety of different guests that have supported me in getting this completely and utterly off the ground. So thank you to all those that have preceded this that have certainly helped me to become the best version of myself as a podcast host. Today we have Maya McGlynn, who is a PA-based photographer and writer. She's published four children's books, which we talk extensively about because that is really a big passion of hers. The most recent one being Bigger Diggers. This book is based on photographs that she's taken during her quote-unquote day job as a marketing manager for a heavy equipment dealership. And in that story, she promotes finding unique strengths and differences and coming together as a team. There's a sequel currently in the works being illustrated And in her books overall, they focus on teaching important lessons and empowering kids while also shining a light on real-life roles and jobs. She's very passionate about skilled trades, more specifically blue-collar jobs, which we get into a little bit with this episode. And she actually is an ambassador of also a nonprofit called The Crew Collaborative, which we'll talk about quite a lot also aiming to help educate and inform the youth on blue-collar construction industries and to break the stigma that's usually surrounding these areas. Besides her marketing, she does do photography, in which we talk about some of the things, including some of the portraits and weddings that she's done, including even the commercial and product photos and digital marketing that she creates as a content creator. She also is a Reiki practitioner, and also a transformational life coach. I know also just working and talking with her, she has been one of those guests again that works on so many different things, but they all have a different type of thread to it each time that I talk to someone. And hers is no exception in which she talks about the divorces that have made her into the modern Brady Bunch that I absolutely enjoy hearing about how she creates that communications, those relationships with other people, but more importantly, having the determination to live life with passion and love. With that, let's go to the episode. All right, we have Maya McGlynn with us. Maya, thanks for sharing your heart with us today. Thank you for having me here. I'm excited to get to chat with you. I am too. And I really enjoyed our conversation even beforehand because I felt like we got to know each other. I feel like there's some energies aligning in the universe when it comes to that too. And I already let the audience know even before we got started with this about what you exactly do. And I just want to start off with this question first. I know that you have written a lot of different books, and I know you got a book that you're working on right now. I really want to dig into what was your main motivation for being an author? Because I've had some authors on the show already, and they've told me a lot about what some of their motivations are. And I've been really fascinated with what their story is as it comes to that. So do you mind sharing your story as to how you started writing stories? For sure. I would love to. Actually, I grew up around children a lot. So far, my publications are children's books. I have four books already out. And then I have another one coming. It'll be coming probably early next year, if not by late this year. It's actually a sequel to Bigger Digger. So I'm pretty excited to get that out there. But I'm also working on a memoir. So that'll be for adults. I worked with children at a very young age. My job was at a daycare facility. My parents took in foster kids. I was actually the only biological child until I was eight years old and I really wanted siblings. So I have always really valued the role model scenario. I've always felt like I wanted to live a life that was an example to others that maybe they needed 
a helping hand or a guide. When I got into a place in my life where something just hit me, these ideas started to come to me and I thought, you know what, I'm just going to run with it. And I started with a story called When You Give a Girl a Hammer. And it was actually inspired by my nieces and my sister. We come from a background of strong women. And I remember my mom in our youth coming home from school and she had stuck a hammer through the wall because she decided that that wall was no longer going to be there. She was going to turn that into a nice loft. And so that's the example that I had growing up. And then to watch my little sister raising her little girls in the same kind of mindset as she was rehabbing a house, it just took this form in my mind. And I just penned when you give a girl a hammer. And from there, it just opened something for me. And I created when you give a mom a minute out of inspiration, again, from people in my life, people like myself who are really juggling the role of being a mom, the most important one, but also really career-driven, entrepreneurial, and trying to really make a go of it and still wanting to communicate to their children that they are everything. Even in those moments where we're not actively seeming like we are thinking about our kids, We really are like, they're always on our minds, no matter what we're doing. So that story came from that place and it continued to kind of roll into the next thing. And I just kept creating and I love it. I can't stop. I love the fact that you are very creative and that you don't stop because I know that you also own a photography business, which we shared. And I've had a photographer on the show before where we talked about what are some of the things that are really important to them when they are working with clients or even taking their photographs. And I'm always interested in this, too. So I was wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about when you're working with people or you're working on a particular event or even first off. Describe what kind of photography that you do for us. And then secondly, what do you really look for when you're taking that photography? Is there a certain element that you're trying to get? Is it the lighting? Is it the reflection of the character of a person, the place or the thing? Can you share us a little bit about that? Because I'm always fascinated by like what people see and how they interpret that. It's so interesting when you ask any photographer about this sort of thing, you get a different answer, right? Yes. I I love that so much. (laughs) Yeah. I was actually in a conversation with someone earlier today and it was a a meeting about a total different thing. And there was art on their wall. And I said, oh, who's the photographer? Well, here it turned out it was that person. And it stemmed this whole other conversation because we were from different places with what we liked and what we looked for. And so I do largely portrait photography. I do wedding photography. So my area is focused largely around people. I like interacting with people. I like having them and helping people find a different way to see themselves or see their best selves. My favorite is working with seniors one-on-one, like senior class getting that little bit of time with them to let them really express their personality and let their character shine through at this time in their life where everything is just changing for them. And they're going to be leaving behind this one area that they've known for so many years. And some of them moving on to college, some making some other adult decisions. And so it's this one like pivotal milestone. And I get to just have fun with them and really let some of those things come alive. So I love that. I am big into working with light and shadow. I love some deep contrasts that also comes into play because I also do commercial photography. So I photograph things like heavy equipment. That's part of a part-time day job as well. So that's part of what I do for them. I photograph heavy equipment, which coincidentally was the inspiration for bigger diggers. (laughs) So all of my things kind of marry each other and everything grows as a whole from what I produce, but I do love different contrasts in textures and in light and shadow. I can't really niche down as well as a lot of people say you should, because I like so many different things and I get bored very easily. So that tends to work in 
various ways. It allows me to kind of go left or right whenever I feel the need. And I have a lot of fun with it. I see that you have a lot of fun of it because I've been scrolling through your photos <laughs> as we were talking and I didn't have a chance really to scroll at them closely before we started. But I just find it so fascinating like how you do use that contrast, that lighting and shadow. These are incredible photos and of all different locations, all kinds of different people, all kinds of different types of situations. I'm like in mesmerized as you were talking. I'm like over <laughs> here like, oh, my gosh, these are really oh, good. Thank you. When you're talking about heavy equipment, can you tell us a little bit like what that is? Like, are you talking about like big tractors and things of that nature? I am talking about like big haul trucks. Wow. The inspiration for one of my characters in Bigger Diggers is actually like the biggest rigid haul truck that Volvo makes right now. I got to go to a site to a demonstration of that. I got to ride in it front row seat and see out. I took pictures of that whole event and looking at them, I looked at the face of that thing and I was like, this looks like it should have eyes. It looks like it is a character of some sort. And there became Harry Haller. That's how he was developed. It's my favorite one. I have gotten to drive the A60 articulated Haller. They call those wiggle wagons. That was weird. Yeah. That was weird to drive because I'm not used to that articulated thing. So backing up becomes a whole nother. I just can't. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. They let you actually go in and actually drive this thing? <laughs> I did. I did. One of the guys did take me and let me drive it. Yeah. That is so cool. I grew up on a farm and I didn't tell you this, but my parents had Alpine Nubian dairy goats and I used to drive the dad's tractor around. So it was not like these big tractors. It was a Ford tractor. It had a bush hog front end loader so that you were able to lift things around. I had nothing like what you just drove. And I'm just like, oh, man, I wish I was there. I would have had fun. <laughs> Oh my God. But that farm life is like something that is like after my own heart. I actually traveled out to Idaho and they were planting the potato fields. And because I have a friend that's a potato farmer and it's just, it's mesmerizing to me. Like the, what the science behind everything for that, it's just amazing. So as you can see, I have a love for such a vast amount of things in life. I think I would just experience all the things if I could. I've loved that because I've had people on this show that have really expressed their interest for international travel. I've had international guests that have talked about their enjoyment to going different countries, even in the United States. It's incredible just to have all this wide variety of different likes and interests. With that said, I know that you have been through a very unique journey to get to this point. And I was wondering, because I've gone through two divorces and I have to be honest and transparent. I have never been married and I don't know how that exactly feels per se to go through that sort of thing. But my question is twofold. A, have any of these experiences with your relationships been a motivation for you to enter into the careers that you've been doing with writing the books or even going through and taking these awesome photography sessions with people, places and things? And then the other thing is, is there anything that you would have changed differently when it comes to going through those experiences? Meaning, would you feel like it would have made you the person that you are today if you didn't go through those things? And I know those are pretty deep questions, but I think that for some people, and I'll give you a moment to think about it. I was thinking about this even before we even started, is that some people go through life stuck in those sort of situations. Sometimes they never even take that sort of action or that first step. So they never get to unlock some of those things or they get trapped in those sort of circumstances and they never really overcome that. And I feel like for you, just hearing what I've heard so far, you have overcome that and so much more. So I was wondering if you could share with us a little bit about that and answering some of those things that I've mentioned to you. Yeah, I guess what I could say is I did get inspired to do some of the things that I do by my life experience. And I think that one of those things is when you're forced, and I don't mean to, to take away anything as male, female too much, but as a female, it was kind of a unique scenario to that. 
I had to start over multiple times after having kind of relied on a male partner situation very heavily, especially in my first marriage. I started out being very independent, but I gave away a lot of my independence. And what came about after that was a raging independent woman. You know, I felt that I didn't ever want to go through the experience of having literally nothing again, like nothing, no home, no, nothing to call my own. There's nothing. I was going to say you lost everything as a result of this. Yeah. My first marriage ended. I was 25. I had two kids that were just under two. They were 14 months apart and it fell apart and it fell apart dramatically. And it was not an easy or amicable divorce. There was a fight every step of the way. It took three years to complete that divorce. And it was three years of struggle and went on to be many, many more years of very difficult and trying times with that person. And that definitely inspired me to be gritty enough to go after doing things on my own. There is something to be said for just working at it and trying it out. Like if it doesn't work out, fine. What did I have to lose? It took me a really long time to get to that point where I realized you can take a little risk because really what do you have to lose? What's money? You can get more later. If it all goes today, you can still get more tomorrow. There's more out there to be made. So take the chance, do the thing. If it doesn't work out, dust yourself off and do the next thing. That's how I've learned to be about it. But it took a really long time and it took going through getting to where I could get married a second time was a whole process in and of itself. And then that marriage, actually, it took me four years to get down the aisle and then three years being married. And that fell apart also very dramatically. These are things that I do dish in this memoir that I'm doing right now because, and the whole purpose of this is because I realized over time that these things that I experienced were challenging and could have been handled in some extremely ugly ways. And I could have allowed them to destroy me as a person, to make me bitter, to make me fill my heart with hate. And that was an underlying lesson in the whole thing was I was not willing to let myself become hardened because of these experiences, because of what other people did, the decisions that they made that affected me. I wasn't going to let that become who I was. So I feel like other people need to know that they can get through things too. They can do hard things and they don't have to let it make their heart hard. They don't have to let it fill them up with hate. I'm speechless because I, first off, I want to say this: you hit the nail on the head about the difference between what a woman goes through and what a male goes through. And I certainly don't want to downplay anything that anybody goes through, because I think for either side of it, it can be traumatic in its own ways. But hearing your side of it, Maya, I really think that for some people, it's really hard to get to that side of thinking, oh, I need to do something about it. And I know that I, it's going to be messy, but I still need to do something about it. But they get stuck with that thought. And I've worked with clients that in a life coaching perspective, since I do that for my business, I've had people that are like, I'm just stuck in this. And I don't know whether there's going to be any freedom. So I have to coach them through not only the goals that they have to set for themselves, but I'm taking a big risk because some of them might be female. Some of them might be male. I'm putting my perspective out there, but I need to be respectful of what the whole picture is, the bigger picture. And I think that is so important to distinguish. So I really resonated with that and you discussing it because the other thing you said, and this is actually a follow up then because of what you saying this, is that you really asked yourself the question, do I have to hate this or do I do something about it? What chose you to do something about it as opposed to be being filled with hate? Because I know a lot of people that, and especially nowadays, especially in the United States, which most of my listeners are from with this podcast, I know that it's so easy to be in that default position of, I'm going to hate you because you did not do the right thing and I can never forgive you, mm -hmm. where I feel like there should be forgiveness with that. So 
Can you answer why you chose the path you did? That is a really tough thing to answer because I feel like I always said, and I've said this to my children, even forgiving has always been really easy for me, Mm -hmm. like in anything in life. And I feel like that's something that a lot of people really, really struggle with. But the best way that I've said it to my own clients even is by giving someone your forgiveness, you're not necessarily gifting anything to them. You're giving that to yourself. Because if you let hate fill your heart, that's your baggage. That becomes something that you carry. They don't know. They don't care. You know what I mean? Like when that relationship is severed, when there is animosity between two people, that person's over somewhere else going through their daily life. Do you think they really care how you feel? Mm -hmm. Do you think that they're thinking about the fact that you're angry at them? No, they probably like it. So to me, it's almost an act of self-love and also rebellion, if you want to call it that way, by saying, you know what, I'm going to forgive you for me. This is better for my well-being. I want to forgive you for me. Wow. Hearing those words, I'm in this phase of my life myself, and even my audience knows this from some of the episodes I've done as monologues, where I'm sort of reflecting on what can I do differently instead of just going to the default reaction of, oh, that's a terrible idea, or that's really not a good thing to do, Joshua, or reacting to those things that have that venomous, poisonous sort of feeling that gets stabbed inside of you and wanting to remove that. But you're essentially pulling that whole thing out and saying, look, I am going to forgive you because I'm not going to let that be the power over me. And now it resonates with me what you said earlier about not only giving women that chance, because I've been working with women on a nonprofit board myself where I've interacted with them, where they've been beaten down physically, mentally, emotionally, socially, having an economic sort of job. I've seen it all. And it just my heart breaks for those people that really need something to kind of help them through that. Yeah, they need empowerment. Yeah, and that's actually my question is, is it about empowerment for you? That was your source of strength to kind of share that with others. I guess what I'm asking is, we have an audience here that have been people that have gone through a whole kinds of different things in their lives. What would be your advice to somebody saying what you've said? Because these are all great nuggets that, I think are really important. (laughs) If you were to sum it up into a nice, maybe a couple sentences or so, what would you say to somebody that would open up to you and say, I'm going through this and I'm not sure what to do. What would be your advice to them? One of the things that immediately comes to mind is actually completely separate from my own divorce experiences. This was something that came later. My daughter went through anorexia. She is now healthy and doing well, but there was a period as a teenager that I worried about her taking her own life every single day. There was such dark, dark places and such deep anxiety and depression. And I often just was grasping at straws to try to make sure that I could be there for her. And one of the moments that I remember that was really integral and that I know that she kept in mind is that you can feel what you feel. You have every right to feel that way. You need to acknowledge those things and feel them, but don't live there. Give it a little bit of time, give it a little bit of room, but don't stay in that place. And I know that's something that she has used going forward. And one of the other things that I did tell her as well was When you're in your darkest moment, there has to be that little spark somewhere deep down inside. Find that spark and just give it a little bit of air. Just keep breathing on it. Just keep breathing on it because it's going to grow. You get a little bit of empowerment. When I'm coaching women or when I'm talking to my audience, I'm always saying like, as a photographer too, I get to see a lot of people's insecurities and how they view themselves can be so harsh. And a lot of that comes from what we get from the people we've allowed to get close to us, right? One of the things that I like to say is 
you get compliments, right? Somebody will compliment you. Somebody will say something nice about you. And we all feel so awkward immediately. It's like, oh my God, I don't know what to say. And you downplay it because, oh my gosh, they can't possibly be talking about who you are as a person, right? It has to be some inanimate thing about what you're wearing or whatever. And I say, the person that's complimenting you doesn't have to say anything. And if we think about this, it's more likely that people are going to say bad things. People tend to like to be negative more than they like to spit positive things outwardly. When someone pays you that compliment, when somebody gives you a positive little nugget, believe it, hold on to that, live it. They don't have to be saying that. So I feel like people need to allow themselves to revel in that a little bit more than they usually do. And especially women who have kind of let themselves become beat down perhaps by a relationship that they've experienced that they're trying to survive after and figure out a way to thrive. You need to let the little things grow for you. You need to believe those things because they carry you through some of those darker, harder moments. So for me, it definitely is about empowering other people to find the pieces of themselves that they can grow and breathe more life to until they become the best version of themselves. Wow. I am just like, yes, I preach it to the mountains and the valleys below <laughs> because it is so important for us to do that is to create that image. And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional here thinking about this because I've been thinking about all the times, even as a male too, that sometimes even the male masculinity, we hear so much about, oh yeah, you have to be tough. You can't cry. You can't do this and that because if you do, that's going to be looked at as being feminine and you can't look at that way. You have to be tougher than that. And I feel that Nowadays, that sort of conversation is still kind of wavering as in terms of what that direction is. But what I didn't realize, and I think what you opened my eyes to right now, is that women are still fighting that battle and still trying to persevere full through that as much as they possibly can. And I think that there's been a lot of progress. Don't get me wrong in terms of what you've been able to achieve as it relates to that. But just being able to have that positive comment, I can't tell you how many times I wish in my life that I had that growing up. And I feel like that it all starts with being a kid. So with that said, yeah. you are doing some awesome things too to help even adults and maybe even kids that want to become adults in this field to help them become something better for themselves. And you're ambassador for a nonprofit called the Crew Collaborative. And I'm wondering if you could spend a few minutes sharing that with us, because it sounds like exactly what all of us need is to hear some positive affirmation, especially with this. So I'm going to shut up. I'm going to let you talk about it. <laughs> Yeah, so recently I got to graduate as an ambassador with the Crew Collaborative, which is a nonprofit that aims to educate and kind of strip away the stigma that surrounds working in construction, blue collar jobs, that sort of thing. So I actually learned about this. They founded that nonprofit, I believe it was in 2020. And I had seen it through my own work with dealing with the heavy equipment and stuff and kind of have kept my eye on it. And then one day I saw a call for ambassadors and different ways that you can be helping out with their nonprofit. And I just thought, I need to be a part of this. There is something that just really pulls on my heartstrings because I feel that blue collar life and construction work and things like that are things that are getting kind of pulled away from. The youth is not getting enough information about it. And people don't realize how they can go about working in the fields. My job being in the blue collar world, I've worked in industry jobs for, gosh, the better part of my career. I used to work as an office manager in a welding shop. I went on to do operations assisting. And now I'm the marketing department for a heavy equipment company. So somehow I've always ended up, and I always think of myself as such a girly girl, but somehow I always end up in these places in industry and I absolutely love it. But had I known back when I was a kid, this was even an option, maybe I wouldn't have waited so long. Maybe I would have found it a lot sooner. You know, there are jobs out there that 
young people don't realize that they can get into. And there are also the jobs that they do realize they can get into, but they have no idea how. So that's kind of what Crew Collaborative is aiming to do. They have a lot of things that they offer programs to get into schools and help educate everybody. So I'm excited to be a part of that. And I feel like it's a great fit with what I'm doing with Bigger Diggers because, I mean, that book, the whole dedication of it was to the blue collar workforce. It was as an encouragement and a thank you to them for choosing this kind of job and having the kind of work ethic that they do. And the hope that they will share that with their children and their children's children, because we need that. They're yeah. the backbone of the country. They're building things that we don't think about, that we use day to day. But to talk mental health, though, something so interesting that construction actually, like what you were saying about men and the whole idea that men can't be soft in any way, that they can't express emotion and stuff. So obviously in an industrial setting and in that trade kind of class of environment, you're expected to be so tough, like all of the time. So I'm really hopeful and I'm seeing some development of programs that are kind of gearing up to be able to say, hey, you know what? There is a certain amount of awareness we need to start cultivating within this group of people because the suicide rate is insane. If you look up the statistics, it is among the highest. And that speaks volumes to the stress in that life that people are not aware of. And so I would love to see more programs developed in that vein for mental health awareness and that aspect of safety in the workplace really needs to get more attention. And I think even in things like what you and I do with coaching, those are great ways to be able to leverage something because, you know, no, not everybody needs to go to a therapist, but you do need a friend sometimes. You do need somebody who's going to allow you to bounce things off so that you can decompress and deescalate whatever situation you're feeling in that moment. And then it can help you take on the next day. Maya, I really appreciate you sharing all of that. Thanks for sharing about the Crew Collaborative because I'm going to put a link into the episode notes about anybody that's interested in being part of that and being an ambassador. I think it's really important to not only give equal attention to blue collar workers because that's what really allows us to have the infrastructure that we have today. And that's really important. But more importantly, you nailed it too. I, I loved every single thing that you said tonight has been something that has been nailed is that it's really important too to pay attention to the mental health awareness of other people too, especially those individuals because of that being so high. And again, my listeners are well familiar with this, but I'm also going to put a link in the episode notes. If there is a mental health crisis, don't wait, reach out to somebody. And 988 is a very important number to have in the back of your mind whenever somebody's experiencing that. I'll put some notes in there. There's a great website, 988, that involves not only the hotline, but also a whole bunch of things that you can research on your own. Maya, we're at the end of time, but I want to give you the last few minutes here to pitch about your life coaching business. You're a Reiki practitioner. Also, I'm not too familiar with the Reiki. practice. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I see Reiki, this is. Yeah. Yeah. See, this is why I'm learning so much about people as a result of this and that practice, too. So. Do you mind just describing a little bit about that as to close us out about sure, anything that um, you want to pitch? I should say, I, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to mention midlife mediator is a part of my website that basically caters to that idea of having that resource when you need to deescalate a situation. So that's available right through Maya McGlynn books. It's under the personal development section. You can find any of my books there as well. So like I said, right now I have all my children's books available. They're also available on Amazon. And coming soon with the follow-up to Bigger Diggers, which will be Lucan 2, and you can keep an eye out for my memoirs in the future. I am on TikTok as Midlife Mediator, and that's where I largely post any of my coaching information and any of my information or teasers from my memoir that is currently in progress. 
And as always, like my photography business is always going strong. And I run some digital marketing workshops that are available for people to book for their own site with their team. So they can take on the whole marketing thing all on their own. So there's a lot going on in my world. And I love teaching people what I know and helping people. So I'm hoping that by sharing this with you and your audience, that will reach who it needs to reach. I think you've done a lot more than just reach out with that last few moments because you have reached so many people about what you have been through, but how you've turned it into such a positive transformation for not only kids, but also for adults too. And I really love that. Not only do you hit all those angles, but you take that from what's inside your heart, that choice you made. And I I just see it. I hear it tonight from you about that passion and how much you enjoy that. Maya, thanks for speaking from the heart with us today. I really appreciate not only getting to know you better through this interview, but personally, you've made me realize that I definitely don't have to be filled with hate. I really do care about what other people are saying and doing, and that I'm not going to let the hate enable me. I'm going to let the positivity enable me. So thank you for sharing today. Yes, thank you for having me. It's been fun. Maya was one of those guests in which I really had to take a step back after our episode and think about my own life experiences and what we can do to ultimately make some of the choices that we have in our lives. And even after our conversation, we spent some time talking about some of the things that we've been through both in our lives and including some of the things that had recently developed even in my own life, when it came to working through some of the problems that even I, as a coach and a podcast host, even goes through when it comes to not only the personal development, but also the professional development as well. First off, I want to say that it's all about having that right perspective. And I think that Maya could have easily said, yes, these divorces are going to tear me down. They are going to make me not feel as complete as I could. And she stood against that tide in order to say to herself that I can do something that can be incredibly worthwhile. And that's what really made it dynamic for me in that she was so willing to just put herself on the line, knowing that sometimes maybe even doing that can create some of those tensions, some of that pain, some of those things that often push us back and forth and holding us to the fire, especially. Because it's really tough to be able to do that. But she is a nothing-is-off-limits kind of gal. And I say that exactly because the next morning she did mention on a post referencing our Facebook page about the exciting things that had been happening about her life and that being on this podcast was something that helped to enjoy and create opportunity for herself and even some of the people that might be listening to this. And I want to thank her so much for helping to promote that as well. It's all about self-help. It's all about understanding that sometimes we might have to be the ones that push us to the next level. And I've talked a lot over many, many, many episodes about the importance of understanding when you need to seek that help. But now let's change the conversation for a moment to when it really involves us doing just that. To be able to push ourselves, to have strong women, to have strong men that help surround us and create some of the most amazing heartfelt opportunities. Because even as Michael Dugan, the person that you hear every time that opens this episode, or any episode of Speaking from the Heart says, when it all converges into a heartfelt experience, it creates the opportunity to raise people that are not only tough, but they're also willing to accept when they need to talk to someone about it too. And that's what I love about Maya, is that she's not only just a career-oriented person, but at the same time, she can express her own personality through all the different things that she opens up with, whether that is through contrast and textures with her photography, whether that is through the books that she has written to help kids get a better understanding 
of what's really out there in the world when it comes to blue-collar opportunities and even the important life lessons that those books offer. But that's exactly it. We need to be inspired by those life events, to be gritty, to be able to be independent, to know that we need to roll up our sleeves sometimes and say that we have to put ourselves, our hands and feet, bare into the soil, consume that soil for what it's worth so that we can grow and nurture ourselves into something that is in the cards. But are we going to throw ourselves with hate? Do we really think that anybody really cares how we feel? There's always that voice. That's the thing that creates the problems with safety. I know that many of us can be filled with hate. I've seen that. I've been on those Facebook pages. I've been on those LinkedIn pages. I've been on blogs, ladies and gentlemen. I've been on all of them. I've seen everything. I've even had it said to my face. Growing up as a kid, I know how that feels to be treated like dirt. The bad dirt. Not the good dirt. And I know that that can be really, really, really tough. Especially when you really care about what that person's going through. And they don't care in return. We can have those very dark places that we sit in. Those very dark places that I've talked about in many of my monologue episodes. In which I was very scared about the opportunities that presented themselves. The things that I needed to do to crawl out of the abyss and get into the light. But do we always have to be dwelling in those dark places? Do we always have to think that the people, places, and things that we go to are always bad? As one guest recently put it, it's about being able to have that world life view, to have that culture of understanding by traveling and seeing where those places are out there. And I think Maya does that through her imagination and through her vision of what she sees as the inner beauty, which is why I love the fact that she does marketing. I love the fact that she does photography. I love that she expresses herself in her writing because it allows all of us to understand fully the true picture that we can draw of ourselves if we had the same tools at our disposal. Not the same exact tools, though. Because it's fun to be unique. It's fun to be different. It's fun to be on a different type of spectrum, which I've even mentioned about my autism and how it's impacted me throughout my life. And not knowing the answer to get to this point has allowed me to have so much freedom, so much opportunity to realize that I have what it takes. And I think for even Maya, I think that she knows that she has what it takes. We often have to go through a period of trials in which it pushes us to really examine whether we are doing the right thing, whether we are getting involved with all the different types of things that are rolling us into a new future. Even having those different vehicles that we get to test drive in, whether they are big construction vehicles, whether they are dark blue Toyota Priuses, which, yes, full disclosure, I have a dark blue Toyota Prius. It doesn't matter, though, where that vehicle is. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter what we do. We have the tool, and we have all the opportunities to use that tool for our awareness. But it's all about having that spark. Being able to turn the key over into the ignition creates that chemistry in which starts your engine so that you're able to propel at whatever speed that you feel comfortable with, although there are posted speed limits, not only in the state of Pennsylvania, United States, but all across the world on any roadway that you travel on, except if you're in the Autobahn. But sometimes we have to have no speed limit, because sometimes it means that our life is at stake. And I think that our guest, Maya, certainly examined that sort of possibility with many of the different choices that she had. But she used those choices to her advantage. She didn't get dragged down. She became the best version of herself. And she's allowing herself to have that opportunity of a lifetime. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes having that understanding and having that conversation with ourselves about what we can potentially become can be the most difficult thing that we have ever pursued in our entire lives. Having strong women, though, and having strong men, our moms and dads, are even more important than ever before. And I think being able to understand that, to have those co-workers that come and surround you in those big moments of your life, to have family, to be able to do that, whoever you call family, can be helpful to get you to realize that you are the best of the best. It's almost as if you are Mr. Miyagi. Watching the original Karate Kid, I know that Danielson, you can be trained to overcome the odds, to be able to fight back against the Cobra Kai, and be able to learn so much about yourself and others. Because it's all about respect. And sometimes getting that respect means that you have to work for it. You have to roll up your sleeves. You have to do the dirty work. But it doesn't mean that you have to do it all alone either. It's all up to you and how you change your mindset that can make it happen no matter where you're at. And it's all about learning how to grow, how to achieve, and maybe, just maybe, learn how to drive a construction vehicle. Because we all have those precious gifts that we can give to one another. Thanks for listening to episode number 36 of Speaking from the Heart, and I look forward to hearing from your heart very soon. Thanks for listening. For more information about our podcast and future shows, search for Speaking from the Heart to subscribe and be notified wherever you listen to your podcasts. Visit us at www.yourspeakingvoice.biz for more information about potential services that can help you create the best version of yourself. See you next time.